Hello, everyone, and welcome back. My name is Rachel House. I'm a senior data scientist on the AI engineering team at S&P Global. And today, I'm pleased and very excited to take you through an introduction to data linking. We have a lot to cover, so let's go ahead and dive right in. Our first key question is, what is data linking? And we'll get our wordiest slide over with first and see that data linking is the task of identifying, matching, and merging records from multiple data sets that correspond to the same entities. Further, data deduplication is a subset of data linking. And in data de deduplication, the objective is to identify and consolidate records from the same data set, which refer to the same entity. As our first data linking task of the day, we'll identify that all of these terms are in fact the same entity. So know that you may also hear data linking referred to as record linkage, data matching, entity resolution, object identification, or field matching. And now that we have our definitions covered, let's take a look at what data linking might actually look like in the real world. Say for instance, we have two companies, Beautiful Bakery and Dirigible Depot. These two companies realize that there's a market out there for people who dig both baked goods and airships. And so they decide to merge into a new company, Bread Zeppelin. However, Bread Zeppelin now needs to consolidate its formerly two customer lists into a single list. How can they do this knowing that they likely have an overlap of customers between the two lists and that each list stores customers' names and information in a separate format? And the answer, as you might expect, is data linking. That's just a small taste of what you might use data linking for. However, speaking more broadly, we have a need for data linking because of two primary things. First thing, we as humans are generating astronomical volumes of data. And secondly, we have a need to integrate that data. More specifically, we need to integrate data from different sources in order to improve data quality, enrich existing data resources, and facilitate data mining. And it's really the need for data integration which underlies all our use cases for data linking. And speaking of use cases, it's also good to note that data linking is not in fact a new problem. Even prior to computers, statisticians and public health researchers have been interested in identifying records from different databases that correspond to the same entity. One interesting thing about data linking is that it's rooted in the work and needs of national census agencies, and that advances in data linking and data matching have been heavily driven by the areas of census and health. It's therefore unsurprising to see data linking used heavily in domains that feature people, like government census efforts, healthcare, business marketing, national security, and crime and fraud detection and prevention. People are the most linked entity, and later on, we'll see that a lot of linking techniques originate out of a need to figure out if two people on paper are the same person in person. Now, what makes data linking challenging? First, when merging two sets of data, we rarely have shared identifiers. Even within a single table, we might not have keys that uniquely identify elements. Secondly, in the real world, data is dirty and incomplete. And as part of linking, we need to clean and standardize it before it can be linked. Third, the computational complexity of linking grows quadratically. And though compute power has exploded over the last few decades, it's still not enough to brute force your way through linking large data sets. And fourth, there's a distinct lack of linking tra training data out there. And finally, when it comes to linking, especially people linking, privacy and confidentiality of data are key concerns. All right, now, why should you care about data linking? First, it's a really interesting problem. But nerdy pleasures aside, data linking is a valuable thing to know as a professional. You've either already dealt with the complications of integrating data from different sources, or it's only a matter of time until you do. Familiarity with the data linking process and its tools and techniques is going to be a great advantage. Secondly, you are a person. And as we've mentioned, people are the most commonly linked entity. So your personal data has been linked in the past, is likely being linked as we speak, and will continue to be linked in the future. It's good to have an awareness and an understanding of what's happening to your data. While the companies shown in this example are employing other technologies than just linking, data linking is what fuels someone's ability to connect you throughout all the commercial data sets that you are um, a part of. And your privacy is important. And though there's only so much we can do to control our data, especially within the US, awareness of how it's being used is a key first step. 
Now that we've covered what data linking is and why it's important, let's take a big picture look at the data linking process before we delve into the details of each step. First, we'll briefly establish a useful mental model for records and attributes as we discuss them in the context of the linking process today. You can think of records as rows in a database table and attributes as the columns. And the overarching goal of the linking process is to identify records in different data sets that correspond to the same entity. In a linking scenario, you start with your two data sets. Each data set will typically need to be cleaned, um, a step which you will also hear called pre-processing. Essentially, we need to get both data sets into a clean, consistent state that is ready for blocking. The next step, indexing, is also commonly called blocking. This is the step in which we reduce our comparison space by determining which records we need to compare. And the output of blocking is a list of record pairs that will be compared to determine if they are the same entity. In the comparison step, we perform the actual comparison of record pairs and for each pair determine its similarity. The output of comparing gives us a set of features for each pair that we can use as input to the classification step, which is typically a model. And the model outputs a score for each record pair. Based on that output score, we can sort all record pairs into one of three categories, link, non-link, or potential link. The links and the non-link results are typically persisted elsewhere, and the potential links are the links that need to be routed back to a human for review. Based on feedback from human review, we can iteratively improve our classification approach. And finally, based on our resulting links and non-links, we're able to perform evaluation on the linking process as a whole, including the blocking, comparing, and classification steps. Let's discuss the first step in the data linking process, cleaning. We'll start our discussion of cleaning and pre-processing with a reality check. Real world data, it needs help. It's dirty, it's inconsistent, it's incomplete. Even when a given data set is in pretty good shape, there's still the fact that it varies in format, structure, and content to other similar data sets. And the adage GIGO, garbage in, garbage out, certainly holds true with data linking. If data were to be a perfect quality, then data linking could be accomplished through straightforward join operations and no sophisticated indexing techniques or approximate comparison functions would be needed. However, data is highly imperfect. And some of the quality dimensions that we deal with in linking are accuracy, consistency, completeness, timeliness, and believability. Whatever your linking scenario or data domain, you're looking at a few key, key data cleaning tasks in the cleaning and pre-processing steps. Uh, notably, one, determining how to handle missing values, two, smoothing your noisy values, and three, identifying and correcting inconsistent values. If you've ever cleaned data, you know that there's no one particular tool or technique that fits everything. It's highly dependent on the data set. I'm not gonna talk a ton about the details of cleaning data other to say that yes, regexes are a superpower when it comes to cleaning. Instead, we'll focus on the desired outcome of cleaning and what we need to achieve before we're ready to move on to the next step of data linking. If your data cleaning and pre-processing step is successful, then raw input data is converted into well-defined and consistent formats, and equivalent information is encoded in the same way for the separate data sets. Once we've cleaned our data, then we're ready to get blocking. Logically speaking, to determine if a pair of records refer to the same entity, we just need to compare them, right? So if data set A has three records and data set B has three records, we can just compare all the records of A to all the records of B and we've accomplished our linking. Sweet, just nine comparisons. However, this does not scale well. Comparing each record of a data set against each record of the other data set is known as a Cartesian join. And in fact, it scales quadratically. So imagine needing to tell your boss that you'll have their linking results sometime in the next few millennia. Probably not gonna go over well. We need to be able to selectively and intelligently decide which records to compare so that we can reduce the comparison space. And the majority of comparisons that we will make will be between records that are not links. And this is where indexing comes in. So at its heart, indexing is really just a filtering step. We want to filter out record pairs that are unlikely to correspond to links. And we go into the indexing step with the full set of possible pairs. And ideally we exit the indexing step 
with a vastly reduced subset of those record pairs that are then sent to comparison. We also want to minimize our mistrue links. Namely, we don't want our indexing step to filter out record pairs that actually are links. Blocking is a conventional indexing technique, which is why you'll often hear indexing and blocking used interchangeably. And the basic idea behind blocking is that you break your record pairs into blocks or groupings based on some sort of blocking key, which you may also hear referred to as a predicate. So in a people data set, a blocker might be a person's last name. For example, we want to group all the records with a Thompson surname together to compare. And in a property data set, a blocking key might be the state in which a building resides. Individual blockers are generally very simple, but they can be combined into composite blockers with logical operators. In blocking, record pair comparison is symmetric. So each unique pair is compared only once, even if it's filtered by multiple blockers. Our goal for a successful blocking key is to group similar records into the same blocks. Now, what do we need to consider when we're defining blocking keys? Well, first we have attribute data quality. As we've already covered, real world data is dirty and incomplete. The quality of the data attributes you have available are going to directly influence the quality of your blockers. For instance, if you have an attribute that has tons of missing values across the data set, then you're going to get a lot of records sorted into a block that has a null value for the blocking key, whether or not those records are actually similar to each other. Second thing to keep in mind is your attribute value frequencies, meaning the distribution of the values contained within the attribute. If you have a really skewed frequency distribution, the most frequent attribute values are going to dominate the record pairs that you generate via blocking. For instance, um, if you're blocking a people data set on surname, you're likely gonna have really large blocks for common surnames like Smith, uh, resulting in a lot of candidate pairs that get sent to the comparison step. The advice is generally, when possible, select blocking keys where attribute values have a frequency distribution close to the uniform distribution, which will give you more or less equal sized blocks. And here, I'd like to mention phonetic encodings in particular, because they are very useful when it comes to blocking, especially for people data sets. A phonetic encoding converts a string, normally a name, into a code based on how it's pronounced. There are a number of established and popular algorithms out there. The heavy hitters you'll come across will include SoundX and Ysys and Double Metaphone. So there's a lot of opportunity for error in our common forms of data entry, like typos, incorrect transcribing, OCR mistakes. Phonetic encodings allow us to normalize the pronunciation of values, which can help to overcome data entry errors and typos during the blocking process. It's also good to know that blocking is not the only indexing technique. Sorted neighborhood is a newer alternative to conventional blocking. In sorted neighborhood, you sort your data sets by a sorting key, which is analogous to your blocking key and blocking. And then you move a sliding window of fixed size over the data sets. And at each window step, you generate candidate record pairs from the records that are contained within the window at that step. Here's a visual depiction of the differences between a blocking approach versus sorted neighborhood. That said, know that generally, the most important aspect of the indexing step is not which technique you use, but the definition of your blocking or sorting keys. In summary, the output of the indexing, or most commonly blocking step, is the record pairs that will be compared in the next step of the data linking process. And that next step is comparing. Once we have our record pairs from blocking, we'll want to compare each pair. Now, each record from each pair is going to have a collection of attributes, and we want to compare these attributes between the two records to figure out whether or not the pair are a link. However, the problem is that we can't just see if the attributes match exactly and then call it a day. Remember that our data, though cleaned and pre-processed, still likely won't be in a form where exact matching is always possible. And so rather than a binary determination of yes-no for whether two attributes match, we can place their degree of similarity on a scale or continuum. When we examine a particular attribute pair of our record pair, we want to use a similarity function which normalizes the difference between the attributes to a range of zero to one, with zero indicating that the attributes are completely different and one indicating that they're an exact match. And note 
the, the definition definition of completely different and exact match will vary depending on your particular attribute at hand. Your typical record attributes and data linking will be strings, numbers, dates, and locations. And given the importance of people in data linking, one could even consider names to be their own category of attribute type. Now let's take a look at how we can compare attribute values in our similarity functions. First up is exact comparisons. Though exact comparisons can't be employed for all record attributes, there are occasions where they might make sense. And as you would expect, exact comparisons are straightforward. Are the two values identical? You can also employ exact truncated comparison in which you look at some subset of a string or pattern, such as the first five characters of a string or the last two digits of a number. Note that you can also use exact encoding comparison where you determine if two attributes that were previously encoded in the linking process, like with a phonetic encoding algorithm, now have the exact same encoding. As you might imagine, in linking, we encounter limitations with exact matching really quickly. We need a, new, a more nuanced way of judging string similarity. And for this, we can use edit distance. Edit distance is a widely used comparison in linking and is based on counting the operations required to transform one string to another. Transformation operations, or edits, include single character insertions, deletions, substitution, and swapping. Different edit distance comparisons use and weight the cost of these operations differently. Levenstein edit distance is one of the more popular edit distances. Allowable operations are insertions, deletions, and substitutions, all with a default unit cost of one. So if we wanted to transform cat to cats, that would be a cost of one. We have a one character insertion. If we want to transform blocks to socks, that would be a cost of two, where we have a deletion and a substitution. There are some notable variations in Levenstein edit distance out there that you might see, including um, the Damerel Levenstein, which adds swapping two adjacent characters in, as an edit operation. And this is a great comparison uh, when you need to accommodate common data entry typos of transposed characters. The Hamming distance is another variation which only allows substitution. So if you're using it, your strings need to be of the same length. And more generally, most edit distance measures can introduce cost modifications, which allow you to indiv individually weight edit operations if you don't want them all to have that default cost of one. Another string comparison approach is a Qgram based comparison. In Qgram comparison, the input strings are split into substrings of length Q. And the similarity between two strings is then based upon the number of Qgrams that they have in common. The Jarrow Winkler string comparison family combine both edit distance and QGram based techniques to compare strings. And these comparisons are designed specifically for the comparison of names. And they're based on data matching work that was conducted at the US Census Bureau over many years. The Jarrow function counts the number of common characters and transpositions in two strings within a window of characters. And the Jarrow Winkler variation increases the Jarrow similarity value for up to four agreeing initial characters from the start of the string. And this is based on findings from the US Census Bureau as well as other empirical studies that have shown that fewer errors appear at the beginning of names as opposed to the end. While character sequences tend to dominate the attributes that we compare in linking, it's also possible to determine similarities between other attribute types, such as numbers, dates and times, and locations. For numbers, typically we're interested in whether two numbers are within a max absolute or max relative difference, as well as what that difference is. For dates and times, we often also look at an absolute date time difference between two attribute values, um, but we also often compare them in a way that accounts for common typos, like transposed digits for the month, such as 01 for January versus 10 for October. For locations, geographical distance measures like Haversine distance are very useful. We really zoomed in on comparing individual date, data attributes, so I'd like to zoom back out to put all this in context for the comparison step. So the input to the comparison step is a collection of candidate record pairs. And during comparison, for each candidate pair, we compare our left and our right record of that pair. To compare two records, we compare their individual attributes and we record the similarity score of those comparisons. And those similarity values are then concatenated into a comparison vector for the record pair, 
which summarizes the similarity of the two records as determined by their individual attributes. Thus, the output of the comparison step is a comparison vector for every single candidate record pair. We've indexed, we've compared, and now we classify. The classification step of linking uses the similarity values in the comparison vector of the candidate record pair to determine how likely it is that that given pair is a link. And if you were thinking that the comparison vector looks a lot like a feature vector that you might feed to a machine learning model, then you'd be right, they're equivalent. The purpose of classification is to designate a given record pair as a link or not a link based on its comparison vector. The classification approach will yield a single similarity score, which indicates how likely it is that the pair is a link. And using the output similarity score, record pairs can then be sorted into two classes, non-links or links based on a score boundary. And this is commonly called thresholding and the score boundary is referred to as a cutoff. The cutoff determines which record pairs get classified in which bucket. In the real world, we often have two cutoffs so that we can sort into three classes, non-links, links, and potential links. Potential links are those tricky record pairs that need to be routed to a subject matter expert for clerical review to get a definitive classification. When it comes to classification approaches, the simplest method is SimSum, which is a cute moniker for summing the similarity scores of the comparison vector. And as you can see in the example, to determine if a candidate record pair is a link, we simply sum the similarity vector and apply a threshold to that resulting score. Simple. Thresholding with the SimSum method, however, though straightforward, has some drawbacks. Namely, all attributes contribute equally to that final sum similarity, sum similarity, and information contained in those individual values is lost in that single summation. Rather than a deterministic approach to classification, we can also use machine learning. As you've seen, the vectors generated in the comparison step can be used as feature vectors. So if you take a supervised learning approach to classification, you can feed your comparison vectors to your models of choice to train them. And then you can use the model inference scores plus a threshold to classify your new record pairs. Note that for supervised learning, as you would expect, you also need to know the appropriate labels for your comparison vectors, true link or true non-link. And you might not always have that ground truth data. In data linking, we commonly use active learning to get around the need for an extensive upfront training data set. Active learning takes an iterative approach to building a linking model. You start by building your initial classification model with a small seed of training examples, usually a handful of comparison vectors that correspond to clear links and clear non-links. You use that model to classify a new unseen batch of comparison vectors. And then you route those new model results to human subject matter experts who can assign a ground truth label. Once vetted, these examples can then be added to your growing collection of labeled training data. After that, it's pretty much rinse and repeat. At each stage, you evaluate your classification model and keep iterating until it achieves its desired performance. It's also possible to use unsupervised learning as a classification approach. And when you do employ an unsupervised methodology, generally you're looking at a clustering or grouping approach where each cluster consists of records referring to the same underlying entity, ideally with a high intra-cluster similarity and a low inter-cluster similarity. You don't need labeled training data for an unsupervised approach, and often unsupervised approaches for data linking are uh, quite suited towards deduplication use cases. After we've built out our cleaning, indexing, comparing, and classification steps, it's time for evaluation. Now, when we link data, our objective is to identify true links pairs of records that re represent the same real world entity. However, how can we evaluate if we've done that and done it well? If you have ground truth evaluation data or a holdout set that has known true links and true non-links, then you can calculate metrics based on your output classification scores. And this is a big if, because ground truth linking data is scarce. So first, let's take a look at some strategies to acquire ground truth data. There are a number of optimistic solutions that you might be able to use to acquire ground truth data. First, 
you might be able to use results from other data linking projects in the same domain. Perhaps another team in your organization has related data that would be suitable, or you're able to source a publicly available data set. You might be able to synthesize data with the same characteristics as the data that you want to link. However, you need to be careful here because you don't want to wind up training a model that just learns to recognize the idiosyncrasies of your data generation process. I call these solutions optimistic because that's what they are. In all likelihood, you're going to need to employ a more involved approach. If you find yourself lacking ground truth linking data sets, you usually have two options. You could sample uh, records from the data sets to be matched and then manually classify those pairs. However, be aware that if you take this approach, you're going to sample a lot more non-links than true links, especially as the size of your data sets increase, and this is due to the class imbalance. And in reality, most people employ an iterative approach to building out ground truth data sets, especially if they're able to combine this with an active learning-based approach to classification. As the human SMEs validate model output from increasingly performant versions of your linking model with those ground truth labels, then you can amass your, your uh, trove of golden data. Building good ground truth linking data sets, it, it takes time and money, but it's a valuable resource to have invested in. Right, once you have labeled training data, you're able to evaluate linking performance. You'll recall that it is the similarity score generated by the classification step, along with a threshold or cutoff, which classifies the given pair, uh, record pair as a link or not a link. Thus, one of the most important decisions you will make during evaluation is where to set that cutoff. And here, when you see model cutoff, we're referring to the classification approach, which is usually some sort of model. If a given model cutoff score determines which pairs get classified as links or not links, then at a given model, model cutoff score with validated pairs, we can calculate true positives, true negatives, false positives, and false negatives. We can do this because we know what the true links are and whether they've been classified by the model as links or non-links. And we know what the true non-links are and whether they've been classified by the model as links or non-links. This in turn gives us access to our conventional classification metrics, including accuracy, precision, recall, and F1. However, note that accuracy is not a suitable linking evaluation metric due to the wild class imbalance. Don't use accuracy to evaluate linking. Stick to precision and recall instead. Our model cutoff score affects the evaluated performance of the model. For instance, if we did, decided to lower our existing cutoff in the example here from 0.65 to 0.5, we'd increase our recall because we're capturing more true links, but we decrease our precision because we, we would be classifying more non-links as links. And on the other hand, if we increase the cutoff score from 0.65 to 0.8, we decrease our recall because we'd be classifying fewer true links as links, but we'd increase our precision because we'd be classifying fewer non-links as links. Thus, typically you'll calculate precision and recall over a range of model score thresholds in order to evaluate your linking model performance at those thresholds, as well as figure out where to set your cutoff. The cutoff, precision, and recall, they're all interrelated as you can see here. And it really comes down to your particular use case, you know, your performance and business requirements that are going to drive the, your selection of the cutoff score and therefore the evaluation of the linking model. Cool, we've made it through the linking process. Congratulations. We've covered a lot of ground today. And so I will recap the most important takeaways. As you've seen, Linking is a challenging, prevalent, and relevant problem in today's data-saturated world. The key steps of data linking are clean, block, compare, and classify. And finally, you as a person are the most commonly linked entity. And with that, thank you. It's been such a pleasure speaking at the UVA Women in Data Science Conference today. I hope learning about data linking has been fun and informative, and I wish you all the best of luck in your data linking quest. We are at time, and so please enjoy a short break before our closing keynote and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs>